We have to get our story straight. We already know our victim, but now we need to know who done it. Let's break down the first two episodes of Cruel Summer Season 2 and find out just what happened. <laughs> What's going on you lovely people, Lisa here, and it's been a while since season one of Cruel Summer came out, but we are finally back to talk about season two. Now we've got a whole new story presented kind of the same way as season one, and this time, instead of like a kidnapping type of whodunit thing, we have a murder mystery. Now I will say that these first two episodes for me started a bit slow, but they left enough little crumbs and secret things to keep me tuning in and um yeah don't worry i'm gonna keep watching the whole season i'll be here for you guys okay so just like season one we have three different timelines each given a distinct color grading so that you can tell them apart thankfully they also have different looks for most of the characters mainly uh sadie stanley as megan has the biggest transformations from season from uh, timeline to timeline so unlike season one each timeline is not one year this time everything just takes place over the whole course of one year so our three timelines are the summer of 1999 winter of 1999 and summer of 2000 so yeah it just kind of shows how much can change and how much stuff can really go down in just a year i will say from the start the show really punches you hard in the face with nostalgia like they go for it especially with this soundtrack and if you're from that era like i am you'll be happy i feel like it's just like this nice little nostalgic kick but also you got to remember it's a, kind of a blow right here that pretty much the, most of the main cast of kids were not born. I was probably not even a thought yet. I wasn't born yet. Oh, I was born in 2001 though, so not too far off. I was a twinkle in my mom's eye. But yeah, the soundtrack out the gate is well lit. Yeah, I'm sorry for that bad joke, but the first song you hear in this season is my own worst enemy by lit. But yeah, I think that's one of the things I like about the Cruel Summer series is that it really transports you back to those different time periods. We had the 90s in the first season and now we have the 1999 Y2K 2000 here. And it's just like the technology, the fashion, the music, you really feel like you are somewhere else. And it's kind of funny to remember that if you were alive then, that we all freaked about out about Y2K, like the clocks turning to 2000. We thought like the world was gonna implode. <laughs> what a fun time. All right, but I am getting off track. So let's just get down to business. I will have time codes down below if you wanna skip around, but we are going to start with our summer 1999 timeline, which takes place between July 16th and July 18th for these first two episodes. I'm just gonna run through what happens and then all my theories and thoughts will be towards the end. All right, summer timeline of 1999. The season takes place in a small town in the Pacific Northwest called Chatham, where pretty much everyone knows everyone and everyone knows everyone's business. We have Megan Landry who lives with her little sister Lily and her mom Debbie. Now Megan is kind of this goody good computer nerd and I don't mean nerd in a bad way, I mean it lovingly because I was pretty much like this in high school as well. But she doesn't really drink, she doesn't party a lot, you know, she really spends her time focusing on school, her computer coding, and working to save up money for college as she wants to go to the University of Washington for computer science. She also seems like the responsible one in the family as it seems like they may be struggling financially. Now her best friend is Luke Chambers whose dad Steve basically owns most of the businesses in Chatham. They're very well off and these two, Megan and uh, Luke, have been best friends forever. We also find out that Debbie works for Steve. Now Luke doesn't want to follow in his father or his brother Brent's footsteps to go to Branson, I think it is, and study business. You know, he wants to step out of their shadow, but he's having trouble confronting his dad and talking about that with him. Then enter the wild card, Isabella, an exchange student that Debbie agreed to host. Her parents are diplomats and you can tell from the second she gets out of the car that she is the complete opposite of Megan. And yes, they keep making sure to let you know that these two are pretty much the opposites the whole timeline of summer 1999. Isabella is the well-off confident one who knows what she wants. I mean the girl the first day like within less than 24 hours of being in Chatham kind of picks up that maybe there's something going on with Megan and Luke but she ends up asking and Megan says no Luke's like a brother and you know what Isabella's like is it okay if I hook up with him? I mean she gets a plus for asking permission but like I said she wasn't even in town 24 hours yet and she's really got her mind set on I'm gonna get this guy but if I had a dollar for every look of jealousy from Megan or Isabella throughout both of these episodes I definitely have a good starting point I can go get maybe like a like a McDonald's happy meal or something I'm just kidding there, there was a lot we're also introduced to a few other characters that I feel like may play a bigger part later. We end up meeting Brent, Luke's douchey older brother. 
his girlfriend Parker who has a great taste in music and seems to be a little bit like cold towards Isabella at first as well. And then we have Jeff, this guy who always has a camcorder in his hands. Now Isabella is kind of a mystery. I can't really tell if she's putting on this act or if this is really who she is, but she definitely seems like she can get what she wants. And all we really know is that her parents are diplomats and she's travel the world. We also learn she has a best friend that's named Lisa. <laughs> great name, uh, that we see her writing a letter to because it's like, oh yeah, I gotta remember, this is the time before cell phones. But wasn't, Messenger was a thing back then, a messenger, but I guess she doesn't have a computer yet. I'm overthinking all of this. But in Isabella's letter to Lisa, Isabella ends up saying that she thinks she's gonna like it at Chatham, but there's just one obstacle and you'd guess that'd be Megan, right? Well, by the end of the episode, I'm wondering if that's who the obstacle is going to be. We end up seeing Isabel snooping through Megan's room, kind of returning the favor because earlier in the episode, we see uh, Megan snooped in Isabella's room when she first arrived. Now, when Megan first snooped in Isabella's room, all she really did was look at, you know, Isabella's passport. You see all, see all the stamps and stuff, but something that caught my eye was this floppy disk in her bag that, um, yes, a floppy disk. It brought back a lot of memories, in it. but if you remember floppy disks, I'm giving you a, a virtual high five right now. Anyway, Isabella had one in her stuff that was labeled summer of 98, so whatever I feel like happened in that summer, must be important that she brought this disc with her. Now, Isabella ends up finding Megan's wallet in Megan's room when she's snooping and takes it to her at work, but I'm kind of curious if Isabella snooped at all and if there's maybe anything missing from that wallet. Now, when Isabella visits Megan at work, Luke also shows up and you know what? They're like, let's have a pool party and they head to Luke's house where everyone shows up. Now, Isabella seems determined to kind of win over Megan, so she goes to Luke for advice because, you know, he's gotta be the best one to ask. He's known her his whole life. And he just tells her that Megan has a hard time letting people in, so just be yourself. Now, Megan ends up showing up to the party after work and she kind of watches Luke and Isabella and again with that jealous eye, even though she's pretending like she doesn't have feelings, you can see there's something there. And like nothing awakens your feelings for your best friend like some new girl coming in and stealing him right away, right? Now we do have Luke and Isabella sharing a kiss, but more so we find out that Megan isn't actually Little Miss Perfect like she pretends to be. No one actually knows the real Megan, except now Isabella who is like cracking some things because she's observant. You see, Isabella accidentally spills on Megan's backpack and when she tries to clean it up, she sees a bag of pills in Megan's bag. And so she goes to the hot tub and brings it up to Megan who confesses that she uses these pills, I'm guessing it's Adderall, to help her study and stay up late. Then Megan says this. I'm just doing what I have to, to get what I want. Okay, okay, I see you, Megan. And so does Isabella. Ladies and gentlemen, the real Megan Landry has entered the building. So yeah, this basically sets up that all these people are hiding secrets, but just how juicy do these secrets get? And the last thing we see in this particular timeline is Jeff taking a Polaroid of Luke, Isabella, and Megan, and that is a picture you also see in a different timeline in this episode. Now, if we flash forward to the winter of 1999, that takes place between December 15th and 18th to be exact, we have Megan and Isabella now thick as thieves or ride or dies as they say 6,000 times in this episode. Seriously, if I had a dollar for that, I'd have way more money than the jealous looks and I could definitely probably buy myself a, uh, I don't know, a vinyl record or something. But they are now best friends and they are celebrating because Megan has gotten into the University of Washington and even got a scholarship. And well, back in the summer, Megan wasn't keen on Isabella arriving, but Debbie said Isabella would be the best thing that happens to you or could be the best thing that happens to you. And here now in this winter timeline, we hear Megan actually tell Isabella she's the best thing that's ever happened to her. So you gotta wonder what was the event that really bonded these two. Now we do see that Isabella has definitely made Megan loosen up or in her words has corrupted her which is kind of funny because in the summer timeline Luke was like no one can corrupt Megan and well it looks like Luke and Isabella were only a summer fling because now in the winter Luke and Megan are dating and it actually seems like they're in love we hear the words I love you right before something horrible happens obviously but <laughs> what's weirder is that you know Luke and Megan's parents are also dating each other but now things are starting to get rough for both the Landry and the Chambers families as we see that Debbie has a bunch of past due bills piling up while the investors that were supposed to kind of invest in this big Northland project that Steve was trying to develop are getting cold feet and holding out. Now to get some alone time we have Luke and Megan going off to what I assume is Luke's family cabin where they are having some quality time until they hear these gunshots and they go outside and see this man out in the woods shooting at the birds. 
Now, Megan actually knows who this guy is. I don't think he knows her, but she knows of him and says that it's a man who used to be really high up at Apple and he was like the number 12 employee and he's colluding royalty, but now he's kind of here. I heard him going on at the hardware store about how the world's gonna end on Y2K. If it comes and nothing happens. Uh, just hearing Y2K and how much we worried about that is just... Makes me laugh every time. But now it's time for the Chambers, Luke's family's annual Christmas party. And this is where stuff really starts to go down. And the show gets the ball rolling. So Steve has invited some of these potential investors to this party. He needs the night to be perfect, right? That automatically means this night is not going to be perfect whatsoever. Now he's giving this speech kind of honoring his wife that passed away and their traditions and stuff. And they're going to watch this Christmas movie. So they fire up. The projector well the movie they end up getting um, they are like cozy and warm and maybe by a fire but it's not a Christmas movie instead it's a sex tape with Luke that starts playing and it is stopped before we can actually see who the girl is or identify really any parts of her like like skin color hair anything no identifying things so immediately you think it's got to be Megan right because they're together well we see the only identifying thing in this video besides Luke's face is this pink sweater. And guess who happens to be wearing that same pink sweater at the Christmas party? Yeah, everyone gasps and is like, oh my god, Luke cheated on Megan with Isabella. And we see Megan looks devastated and runs out. So now the whole town thinks Isabella is a SLUT and they're vandalizing the Airstream and all this kind of stuff. And she's now on probation at school. But then we get this twist in the episode. It turns out it wasn't Isabella on the tape and Luke didn't cheat. We see that Megan borrows Isabella's clothes sometimes. So that sweater, yeah, could have been borrowed by Megan since Megan is actually the one in this tape. Yeah, Luke stopped the tape before everyone could actually see who the girl was. And well, now the girls are really gonna prove that they are ride or die for each other. Because Megan is all worried. She's like, if it gets out that I'm the one on the tape, well, I'm gonna lose my scholarship. Everything's gonna go downhill, all of this stuff. And Isabella is just like, you know what? Let everyone continue to think it's me. I'm leaving in a couple months anyway. They've already just branded me this, whatever. I don't care, let's protect your future. I mean, yeah, when you think about ride or die, that's a big thing for a friend to take on for you to keep that secret. They end up burning this tape and you just have to hope that that was actually the only copy of the tape because right now we don't know who made the tape. But they need to get the only other person they know of right now that knows the real truth, Luke, on the same page. Now while Isabella is okay being labeled whatever because she's leaving, Luke isn't too happy having to be known as a cheater but he agrees to just keep everybody happy it's his dad though who is really pissed because this could just ruin you know his reputation his business it's not a good look for the family but now everyone is trying to think of who could have made that tape and there's two names that come to mind one is jeff their friend that always has that camcorder although they think that that doesn't look like his work. And then if you're paying attention, it does seem like if you watch little scenes with him, he's not in it a lot, but if you watch, it definitely seems like he has a crush on Megan. Then you have Brent, Luke's skeezy older brother who has filmed girls at that cabin before. So what does Isabella do? She goes to the Chambers house to try to confront Brent, but nobody is home. Instead, she ends up running in to Parker, who is now Brent's ex-girlfriend. And she reveals that yes, Brent films people and he tried to film her once. So now they're like, let's just try to get into this house and find these tapes. And when they can't find the extra key, Isabella throws a planter into the window and they break in and destroy a bunch of tapes. But they don't have time to search the rest of the house because they hear the garage open and of course they leave and, and the mess gets Luke a scolding from his dad. Now here's the thing, I don't know why the girls went to the living room, opened the cabinet and destroyed those tapes. Why didn't they go to Brent's room in the first place? Because no one should be hiding those kinds of tapes with their family tapes and tapes that have memories of their mom in the living room a public area that just doesn't make sense Th those girls definitely weren't thinking right but brent tells luke that he had nothing to do with this tape stuff but then something interesting happens when we see luke and megan cuddling in her bed talking we hear megan tell Luke that things are gonna be okay, they'll get through this little hiccup, not a little hiccup, this speed bump, and then she calls Luke. You are the most important person in the world to me. I'm not gonna let anything or anyone come between us, ride or die. 
and guess who is eavesdropping? That's not all. Then we see Isabella go downstairs to Debbie and says, I need to tell you something. And of course, that's where we end that timeline. So it's a cliffhanger and you gotta know, what is she gonna tell Debbie? Because what does she know about her? As of now, we only know that she knows about Megan taking pills. But is that enough to really get Megan in that much trouble? And the show really pitched this as a love triangle and maybe that they were fighting over Luke, like they wanted you to think that the girls were jealous of each other over him. Uh, but it seems more like Isabella is jealous of Luke being so close to Megan. Um, but more of my thoughts on that after I get through the rest of this recap and the details. We got to move on to the summer 2000 timeline now to talk about what takes place between July 16th and July 18th. So exactly a year uh, later from when Isabella arrives in the small town to shake it up. We see that something wild has definitely happened because Megan is now full on, well, I'm guessing you call it emo, right? Back then she's wearing all black, has an eyebrow piercing. Yeah, she's probably in trouble because she keeps, keeps trying to avoid the sheriff, but we don't really know why yet. It seems like she's maybe coding and selling viruses to people to make money, and at first she thinks maybe the sheriff was coming to her house because the guy she's selling to snitched. But actually that doesn't end up being what it is, I feel like. Instead, we end up seeing this missing persons flyer on the community billboard, but the whole picture is ripped up, so now we have this mystery of who is missing, and then Parker shows up. None of this would have happened if she never came into town. I think about that all the time. Okay, they gotta be talking about Isabella, right? So at this point, they kinda want us to think it's Luke or Isabella that is missing. Now, when Megan is at the pharmacy picking up her mother's medicine, because we saw Megan earlier in this timeline sorting pills, so it seems like maybe Debbie's been sick, Megan overhears some people saying that a fisherman found a body in the lake, and uh, Megan goes into full-on panic mode, speeding her little old car through like these dirt roads through big ass trees. I'm surprised she didn't hit anything, but uh, she speeds off to that cabin where we saw her and Luke hook up and she definitely seems like she's trying to scrub something off the floor and while this color grading is really dark, you gotta think it's blood, right? One other interesting thing here, I guess, is when she was getting out of the car, we see Isabella's fake ID fall out of the car. Now, I'm not sure if that's actually important. Fake IDs were common back then. Maybe they still are. I don't know. I wasn't cool enough as a teenager to have one, but like, that's not really uncommon for someone to have a fake ID, right? Now, after Megan tries to clean up whatever this, I guess, maybe crime scene is, she gets stuck in traffic, and when an ambulance drives by, she gets tired of waiting and legit just, like, jumps out of the car and runs, leaving her car there. And then she stands watching as the cops end up bringing a body to shore, and we see Steve, Brent, and Debbie run up, and we know who doesn't make it out of the season alive. The missing person is actually... Luke because then we have Isabella showing up right next to Megan saying they have to get their story straight and I just hear the little Law and Order gal go dun 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 but also something at this scene we see Megan share a glance with a man over there and that looks like that dude from the woods right so the fact that they pointed him out in the first place and then this glance is shared he's gotta come into play at some point right or is he just like a like a red herring well, after this revelation that Luke's body has been identified, Megan is back to icing Isabella out. And we learn that Luke didn't die by any kind of accident. It wasn't just drowning. I mean, he did die of drowning, as the sheriff says, but the coroner found other things. There's an abrasion on the ear just above what looks like a gunshot wound, but it's not like a pen one that penetrated. It's just like a graze. But it also seems like Luke had muscle relaxers in his body. So yeah, they're pretty much ruling this now a homicide investigation. And you know who's looking pretty guilty right off the bat? <laughs> Our writer dies. Now, as soon as Isabella hears it's now a murder investigation, she tries to book the next ticket to Paris, but Parker shows up and informs Isabella that she can't leave yet because the sheriff is interviewing everybody again. So Isabella tells Megan yet again that they need to get their story straight and that she's planning to leave, but Megan's like, oh no, 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 you're not leaving me with this mess. Like, if you want me to keep my mouth shut, you're gonna stay. So now we, like, have this whole other secret floating around. Like, why does Megan have to keep her mouth shut? What did Isabella do? Or what did she find out about Isabella? Well, we learn even more as all the friends are being interviewed, and we pretty much learn that Luke went missing, it seems like, the night of the New Year's Eve party or a little bit after, so 
maybe he's been missing for like seven months since it's July now. But uh, we learned that Isabella and Luke dated that first summer. So whatever that hookup was turned into dating. And then by winter, like six, seven months later, Megan and Luke were together. And then at this New Year's party, Isabella left early after a fight with Megan. So what were they fighting about? Was it over Luke or was it about something else? Then it's Isabella's turn to be interrogated and you know what? Good for her actually for calling the sheriff out on being more concerned that she was supposedly on that uh, sex tape than trying to figure out who leaked the actual tape. That's how you can tell this is a different time. But yeah, we see that they've kept up the lie and everyone does still think that Isabella is the girl with Luke on that tape. And it is confirmed that Isabella ended up staying longer in Chatham than she planned because Debbie ended up getting sick. Now we don't know with what or how sick she is, but Isabella is not really giving in to the sheriff's questioning until he brings up her past because it looks like he's been doing some digging. Turns out Isabella has been to three schools in three years and she left the last one mid semester her junior year. He says trouble seems to follow her. And what does Isabella do? She immediately shuts up and says, I want a lawyer, but this only makes her more suspicious in the eyes of the sheriff. What kind of a 17 year old knows when to ask for a lawyer? One who's needed one before. Then the episode ends with Isabella going home and dumping a bunch of pills and getting rid of the bottle and calling her mom saying she needs help and she's in trouble. So those are the big events that happened in these first two episodes. Now let's sit and unpack it all and talk about theories and stuff. You ready? Are you, you ready to go? Let's go. Luke ends up dead and it's like, how? And my thought when we heard about the gunshot, I was like, oh, well they did show us somebody had a gun in this episode. It's that guy who was worried about Y2K and I'm guessing lost his job, the one in the woods shooting at the birds. So does he come into play somehow? Did Megan? or somebody maybe get his gun and that's what happened. Now here's my actual question is, we never got an actual time of death. You would think that the coroner's report, they would say, oh, we think that he's been dead for a month or three weeks or seven months. Who knows, right? But we see after they learn that he is dead and the body has been found, then Megan goes to clean up the blood or whatever that is in the cabin and then uh, we have Isabella flushing the pills. So I feel like his death has to be pretty recent because if something happened in that cabin, you know, if Luke's been missing for that long, wouldn't like the family cabin be one of the first places you check, right? So I don't know, things are not quite adding up for me just yet. I got questions. When it comes to the leaked tape, I, I kind of maybe am still leaning towards Jeff, even though he did seem kind of disgusted by like uh, Megan and Luke's PDA like Brent is such a douchebag like yeah I don't doubt that he is filming people but what would he benefit from leaking a tape of his brother when Brent is already this golden child it doesn't seem like he'd have any motive to do that so then you gotta wonder if somebody else purposely leaked this tape and what was their motive what would they have that they would want to ruin Luke or Megan's life well, here's one of my theories is because we kind of saw maybe the hint that Isabella is obsessed with Megan, her getting upset over hearing, you know, and Megan tells Luke that he's the most important person in her life. And I think she also calls him ride or die, but it's the most important person in her life that really upsets Isabella, who's been eavesdropping. You see her get upset over those specific words because earlier in the episode, she told Megan that Megan was the most important person in her life. Her life so it seems like she's a little upset that she's not also the most important person in Megan's life and remember when she wrote the letter to Lisa and said oh but there might be one obstacle in the way and we thought she was just you know referring to Megan and trying to win her over maybe she was referring to Luke as being the obstacle right but it's kind of hard to read Isabella of what is like real with her so sh could she be somebody who in order to like break up Luke and Megan leak that tape just to get Luke in trouble and try to get him out of the picture, maybe the parents to force them to break up or something. I also just need to know more about the truth of Isabella. She's got some secrets. I don't know if I'm buying that she is a diplomat's daughter. I think there's something going on here. And that floppy disk that she had in her stuff from the summer of 1998, what is on that? Because, you know, What's interesting is that when the sheriff did his digging to at least find that she'd been kicked out of school and stuff, why didn't he like tell her the reason why she was kicked out of school? Like, 
imply like oh well we know that you did this and this instead it was just like you got kicked out of school and trouble follows you well tell me what the trouble is sheriff I know I'm supposed to probably discover it throughout the show, but I want to know now. But those pills that she destroyed definitely had to be muscle relaxers, right? You couldn't really, like, read the label, so, like, I looked it up. There are some pills that kind of look like that that are muscle relaxers, and muscle relaxers were what were found inside of Luke. But, yeah, I just, I want to know why these girls are just now trying to cover everything up. Like, it, once the thing happened, you should have been trying to immediately cover it up, not letting it sit there for days, right? Unless maybe it did, they did do something the night before, we just haven't seen it yet. But when it comes to the guilty scale, which one are we leaning towards right now? I, I guess I'm kind of leaning a little bit towards Isabella, but I think what the show is going to make us do, just like they did in season one, is make you flip-flop a little. Make you see different things between each person being like, oh, now I'm leaning a little bit more this way. Okay, what else though? Uh, well, Megan did say that she, you know, does what she needs to do to get what she wants so could that mean covering up a murder of some sort uh we also got to know what what do you think Isabella is going to tell Debbie do you think she's going to be like oh your daughter's taking Adderall and that's how you know she got really good at school I don't think that's big enough to blow up her whole world. There's got to be another secret that we need to find out here as well as whatever secret that Megan is holding over Isabella to keep her in town for right now. All right, I think I've lost track of whatever the heck I'm even thinking and saying at this point. So let's just wrap this up. Let's recap the things we are trying to figure out so far this season. Who murdered Luke? What secret Megan is hiding? What secret Isabella is hiding? When did Luke's death take place? What caused Megan and Isabella to fight at that New Year's party? And who leaked the tape? Because we also still have the other person, whoever that is who made the tape, knowing the truth but why have they held on to the truth that long if you have theories let me know hit me up because right now i'm thinking everybody looks suspicious even parker who just kind of pops out of nowhere all the time um but yeah let me know all your thoughts on this premiere episode this season this whole story are you into it and who do you think done it after that don't forget to hit that subscribe button and check out more of my videos right over here because you know what i'm gonna be hanging out here all season recapping it for you discussing theories and uh, hopefully maybe we'll figure it out before we get to the finale we'll see but i'm always sitting here rambling i'm lisa see you next time